so good to me. I can tell the world, my God, He smiled on me, and I know that He set me free. Oh. oh, oh. to me oh, oh, oh amazing oh Lord how mm, and I know that it's saying mm, you know that I was lost but now but now but now I'm a, oh Good evening. Let us bow. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today, Lord. Thank you for being so good to us. Um, today, we just ask that you teach us the things that we do not understand. Reveal to us what you want us to know. Through your man servant, JK, thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 I want to say good evening to all, all of good evening. Um, I hope that everyone had a positively eventful day and that you realize that we at least grab hold to some portion of the reality that no matter what the day looked like, we are blessed. Uh, let's give glory to God for showing his glory through that eclipse. What about that? Did it, anybody, anybody in here watch it? Everybody in here get a chance to see it? I can't, I can't fathom what reason a person would not believe that there is a God. Um, electronics can't do that. Technology can't do that. Uh, science does it, but who has a handle on science? Uh, at the end of the day, we know that God did it, and uh, I believe it was just a portion of his glory. It took us wearing shades that were uh, so many times darker than regular shades in order for us to look at the glory of the sun. We call it light, but that's what the Bible means by glory. So much so that if you remember Moses... <clears throat> When God was, uh, when Moses requested of God, Lord, let me see your glory. And God said, you know, you can't handle my glory, but I'll, ha I'll hide you in the cleft of the rock so that when my glory passes, you might see it. In other words, you can't see my day. You can see my dawn 
only if I hide you in the cleft of the rock, which implies that the glory of the sun has nothing on the glory of God. Isn't that something? And if we can't look at the sun, it makes sense that no man could look on God's face and live. Mm. Well, just, uh, I just thought that was amazing and um, majestic. And uh, the world watched, and everybody interpreted it in their way. Many people interpreted it minus God. They admired its beauty, but didn't admire its founder. But we know better, amen? amen. So again, I want to say good evening to you. And um, tonight, we're going to look at the conclusion of the whole matter. This is Youth Month. Um, <coughs> This is not so much a youth lesson as much as it is a life lesson. And we're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. We're going to read the text and then we're going to give some backdrop and some principles and come back to the text so that the, we, we understand why. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 is the last chapter in Solomon's book. Well, whoever wrote it, and we'll ultimately prove that it was Solomon. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Let's get some uh, volunteers to help read. Um, um, my preference is um, New Living Translation, but if you're reading out of another version, just whoever's Everybody just stay connected so that the next person knows where to pick up. So we'll ask Jovita to read three verses and then pass the mic. I have NASB. Okay, go ahead. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened. And clouds return after the rain in the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and mighty men stoop. The grinding one stands idle because they are few and those who look through windows grow dim. Okay. Verses four, five, and six. Someone. Remember him before the door uh, to life's opportunities is closed and the sound of work fades. Now you rise at the first chirping of the birds but then all their sounds will grow faint. Remember him before you become fearful of falling and worry about danger in the streets, before your hair turns white like an, old, like an almond tree in bloom, and you drag along without energy like a dying grasshopper, and the caperberry no longer inspires sexual desire. Remember him before you near the grave, your everlasting home, when the mourners will weep at your funeral. Yes, remember your creator now while you are young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. All Don't right. Verse 7, 8. Was that three verses? I didn't finish six. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Don't, Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. Okay, forgive me for that. Verse 7, 8, and 9. For then the dust will return to the earth, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. Everything is meaningless, says the teacher, completely meaningless. Keep this in mind, the teacher was considered wise, and he taught the people everything he knew. He listened carefully to many proverbs, studying and classifying them. All right, 10, 11, and 12. The teacher sought to find just the right words to express truths clearly. The words of the wise are like the cattle prods, painful but hate helpful. Their collective sayings are like a nail-studded stick with, a, with which a shepherd drives the sheep. But my child, let me give you some further advice. Be careful, for writing books is endless, and much study wears you out. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, everything, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. All right. How many of you have read that text before? Okay. 
Okay, many of you. How many of you, this is your first time reading it? It's okay. If it is, all right. Well, we're going to study it together. Let's, let's, let's talk about the book and the author of Ecclesiastes. Everybody say Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes. Yeah, some people say Ecclesiastes. But you get it. Ecclesiastes is, means a preacher or, the, uh, or a call to the people. Okay. Um, the church is the ecclesia. That's what church is. Uh, thus, ecclesiastes and church, the word church, ecclesia, means called out. E ecclesiastes is the call to the people. So that, that word call is the, um, is the root word in ecclesiastes. First of all, when we're reading this, we're not reading... Um, we're not reading as much of a historical document. We are reading a historical document, document, but it's not a historical document about history like we have in First and Second Kings and Samuel, First and Second Samuel, kind of given a narrative of what's going on. Right? This is part of the books of poetry. It's 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 called wisdom literature or poetry. And uh, it is actually God, the Holy Spirit, giving us an opportunity to open the journal of the author. Anybody ever kept a journal? A diary? Not anybody? All right. So uh, how many of you safeguard it? <laughs> right. Some of you got a key on it. But the Holy Spirit is allowing us to open this author's journal and look at his notes and his observations and his feelings and lessons he's acquired from life. So this is a very personal book, a very personal piece of literature, biblical lit literature, okay? Um, he's coming from a place that this book, there's a lot of pessimism in it. Uh, there's a lot of pessimism because this book is not a list of commands. We're opening a journal, okay? We're opening the journal of, a, of an author who's had an experience or experiences in life and experiences with God and experiences with other people, okay? So, so uh, there's a lot of pessimism in this book, but the pessimism is part of a larger story that comes to a realization, it comes to a head of a realization. Uh, there's, as a matter of fact, this book, if you read it straight, it can make you depressed. There's some depression in here. Uh, if you've ever get a chance to read it, if you're not careful, you, you'll look up from the book and you'll, you'll, need, a, you'll need a song song. <laughs> you need somebody to sing a song of encouragement or something. Uh, because, again, if you just like your journal... It's not all blue skies and rainbows, right? If you ever had a journal, you don't just put surface things in there. You go in deep. And most people run to their journals in, in periods where they have these uh, kind of depressive epiphanies or these realizations or these experiences that are not so good, okay? Um, uh, or lessons you've learned from things you've done, um, uh, make sure nobody gets a hold of your journal. <laughs> um, in this book, there are conclusions that are made from a place of life, um, time, and experience. Okay? Lifetime and experience. That means whoever this author is is writing from life and his, and his time during his time and his experience. So when you read it, you can't read it like Romans like Paul writing to a church. We have to read it like it is. It's a book of poetry. We are, we are taking a, we, we found the author's diary and we're looking into it uh, so that we can see things through the eyes of this author, right? The author is a king, right? Okay, somebody read Ecclesiastes chapter one, verse one. These are the words of the teacher, King David's son, who ruled in Jerusalem. 
Okay, so there it is. We know it's Solomon, right? He's also called a teacher. He's called a king. He's a king. King David's son. And we know King David's son to be who? Solomon. The author is the wisest uh, has the wisest rule, the wisest ruler in Jerusalem. Um, of course, these are things I don't want to take for granted that people know. Okay, out of all the rulers in Jerusalem, he was the wisest. Okay, the author is a builder of great projects. Okay, does anybody know something that King Solomon built that make makes him uniquely stand out? Yes, the mine. No, not of mine. <laughs> That's all right. Yeah, too much TV. That might be the two years. <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark. Temple. He built the temple. Okay? Everybody say the temple. What existed before the temple? Raise your hand. And speak into the mic. What existed before the temple? Tabernacle. Why is that a big deal? What's the difference between a tabernacle and a temple? It was a tent. Tabernacle was a tent. It's the difference between living in a tent and living in a, in a house. It's the difference between living in something that you got to keep changing and living in something more permanent. It's the difference between renting and owning. You get it? One was more permanent. One was fleeting. One was made of animal skins, and the other was made of immaculate material. His father, David, could not build the temple because he was a man of war. So God gave that blessing to King Solomon and gave him the wisdom to be able to build uh, the temple. Uh, he is, uh, the author is one of great wealth and women. Wealth and women. I'm going to let that sit for a little bit. Yeah. And what we're going to find is God never criticized the amount of women he had. He criticized and punished the type of women he had. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I, want, yeah, I may not want to talk about it. We're not going to tell that. But some of y'all are getting quiet. They're like, like, no, that's in the Bible. I'm not going to silence or put my, my, my hand over the mouth of the word, right? Uh, when you read 1 Kings chapter 11, somebody go to 1 Kings chapter 11. <laughs> I need to prove that because some of y'all are looking at me mighty, mighty strange. And some of you are saying, are you saying? No, I'm saying the facts, okay? This is not an indication that a man needs to go out and uh, get wealth in women. But... If you look at this Bible characters, begin with verse number one. First Kings chapter 11, verse number one. What does the Bible say? We'll read down to verse number three. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. Mm -hmm. The Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel... You must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yes, Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. Okay, so watch this. It wasn't that he had a lot of women. It was the type of women he had. I'm going to let that sit. That's right there in the text. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> okay. Way back, way back in the book of Judges, uh, and, in, at the, and in Deuteronomy, God told his people, when you go into the land of promise, do not intermarry with the women. Don't give your sons to their daughters, for their, for their, their, their daughters will turn your, the, the hearts of your sons away from God. So it was an intermingling with, so watch this. He had so many wives and so many concubines, but he wanted a different type. 
I don't know why the heathen women were more attractive and alluring. <laughs> I, I wasn't expecting a, a, a thunderous laugh. Like, what's in y'all's head? All of this, thus King Solomon by description, that's who he was, okay? Wealth and women, right? Um, very colorful character, okay? Um, so we know a little bit about the author, we know a little bit about the book. Um, here's the thesis of Ecclesiastes based on Solomon's conclusion, okay? If we put it in a statement, the whole book, this is the thesis. The thesis or the summation of this book is that the human pursuit of happiness, lingering amazement, value, and satisfaction in the material life is both futile and worthless. A word that you see pop up over and over and over in this book is the word vanity from the King James Version. Another version might say worthless. That means that that thesis, that, the, the thesis that, we're, that we've just read, it means that you chase and pursue happiness and you don't find anything with lingering amazement or value and satisfaction and you find out, based on Solomon's observation, that everything is worthless. It's futile. It's vanity. Only beyond this material world can satisfaction be found. That's it. Now, that sounds depressing, right? Especially because we live in a world where even we are working hard for some level of happiness and satisfaction. This book of Ecclesiastes, now, let, let, me, let me, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Now watch this, watch this. Life without God is worthless, uh, vanity, futile. Now I want you to see, I want someone to get Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 14 and 17, the first scripture. Someone get Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11, 17, and 26. Somebody else get Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 4 and 16. And somebody get Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse 9. So that's a lot. It's right there on the screen. I hope it's big enough for you to see. But he repeats this phrase in, in the first half of his diary. And uh, these cross the phases of his life, right? These cross the phases of his life. He's writing based on his life, okay? Based on having had experiences without limit. Let, let me just say this. I am about 200% certain that all of us, if we had a vast, limitless amount of human resources, how many of us are honest enough to say that whether good, bad, or indifferent, we do more than what we're doing now? If your resources were unlimited. Okay, let's be honest. And somebody say, I do the same thing. Uh, you, you win the lottery or somebody give you a lottery ticket that's worth a billion dollars. You're not about to do the same thing. <laughs> We're going to change the lesson to truthfulness. Everybody turn your Bibles. In. Okay? So you're dealing with a person who had what it took to do what he wanted. Okay? Very, very powerful point. So let's read that first scripture. What does the Bible say? Ecclesiastes chapter 1, 14 through 17 says what? I have seen mm -hmm. 
all the works that are done under the sun. <laughs> and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Okay. Verse, that, go ahead. That which is crooked cannot be made straight. And that which is warning cannot be numbered. I commune with mine own heart, saying, Lo, I am come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. Okay. Um, the New Living Translation uses the term vexation of spirit as chasing the wind. A lot of verses use chasing the wind. Just hold on to that phrase. I, you were at King James. and I, Yeah, yes, sir. that's throwback. Okay. Throwback. <laughs> we need uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 11, 17, and 26. Just those verses. You don't have to read through just each of those verses. Who has it? Okay. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anymore. Okay. Well, the next one. Verse 17 and then verse 26. So I came to hate life because everything done here under the sun is so troubling. Everything is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Mm. Okay, verse 26. God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy to those who please him. But if a sinner becomes wealthy, God takes the wealth away and give it to those who please him. This too is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Y'all see this phrase keep popping up? <laughs> King James says vexation of spirit. But that's, the, that's what that means. Chasing the wind. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 4 and verse 16. Then I observe that most people are motivated to success because they, they envy their neighbors. But this, too, is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Meaningless, worthless, futile, vanity, like chasing the wind. Okay, verse number 16. Endless crowds stand around him. But then another generation grows up and rejects him, too. So it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. You see this? All of these things he's saying, all of it is meaningless. Trying to keep up with the Joneses is meaningless. It, it does not bring you to a place of satisfaction. Okay, Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse number 9. Enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Mm. Just dreaming about life's things is meaningless, like chasing the wind. Uh, what do you notice um, about this term? We notice that chasing the wind or vexation of spirit, in essence, is a pursuit of something that cannot be obtained. You, you'll never get it. And what is the pursuit? Is it money? No, you can get money. Right? Is it, is, it, is it things? You can get things. Is it possessions? You can get possessions. Is it women? You can get women. No. Satisfaction. We have built in our nature an insatiable appetite. We can never be satisfied in this world. Now we can say, oh, I'm satisfied. You, you, we won't stay there. We will never stay at that place because there's nothing temporary that can satisfy beings that are eternal. Now, what do you mean eternal? What am I talking about eternal? Now, we are eternal. Our bodies are temporary, but we're eternal. That means when we die, these bodies 
we do not cease to exist. We are going somewhere, and where we're going is from time with these bodies into eternity without these bodies, but what stays? What do we have in both time and eternity? Spirit, soul. That's what never gets satisfied with the things of the world. And we chase it, we work hard, we do all of these things. Solomon goes over a litany of things. Now, why is he qualified to do it? Okay, now watch this. Uh, before we get into why, this next slide. Life's pursuits are cyclic and retain no ongoing satisfaction. The little girl on the carousel, what do you notice about that picture? She's, do you think she started out that way? No, she didn't. But why is she bored now? Why do you think she's bored now? Y'all speaking in tongues. I need one person as the spirit, some spirit is giving y'all utterance. I don't know. Going around and around, up and down on the merry-go-round. Yeah, it's just a cycle. Cyclic, cyclic, cyclic. Right? Watch this. That's the little girl on the carousel. How many of you were excited on a vacation and got to the point where you said, I'm ready to go home? But excited. Maybe it was a cruise. Maybe it was a five day. And by the third day, you're like, you've seen all there is to see. You've been to every restaurant on there. You've been to the Lido deck. Several times, you've eaten all you can eat, and yet, it gets boring. Somebody had their hand up. Any comments? Anyone want to share? How many of you go to the mall? If you notice, the bigger the mall is, the more cyclic their products. Okay. It's, yeah, okay, you, you, you go from Dillard's to where? Macy's. Macy's. Sears. To what? Sears. Sears. What do they all sell? <laughs> Clothes. I want you to really think about life. It's just the same thing. Cycling around. Same thing. Same thing. Possessions, things. Watch this. Our lives are cyclic. Okay? Education is cyclic. If you go all the way and get the highest degree, you would be a freshman a few times. Anybody been a freshman more than once? Just the cycle. Yes. Anybody? Any comments? Oh, okay. So this includes what Solomon talks about in, this, in, his, in his diary, if you would. He talks about pleasure. He talks about wisdom. He talks about work. He talks about power. All of this coming from a man that had all of it. So he's writing from a really deep place, a man that had insurmountable riches, insurmountable pleasure. He was able to do whatever he wanted to do. So it, it, it behooves us to really take this book, Ecclesiastes, seriously as a book of practical principles that help us to stay away from being greedy and from being in pursuit of a satisfaction that the world can give us. Okay? Okay. He had every pleasure, okay? He had, I mean, my goodness, uh, as a man, he had over, a th he had a thousand women. <laughs> I like letting those points sit. I 
I want you to look at, I want you to look at chapter 7. This is just the point. You sisters, uh, thank God for our sisters though. Amen? Amen. Amen. You sisters are so special and meaningful to the church. Okay? We, I don't know where we would be without you. And that's my deposit before making this scriptural withdrawal. <laughs> Start with verse 26, somebody. Uh, not out of King James, please. New living, preferably. Yeah, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Verse, start with verse 26. One, one discovery. A woman can be a bitter pill to swallow. What version is that? It's, <laughs> Please read out of the New Living Translation. But this was good. <laughs> Not a translation you wrote. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we don't want to read out of Jesse Jones' translation version. Hey, we're, that, that New Living. Good, though. New Living Translation. Yes, sir. Okay. Begin with verse 26. Okay. Uh, I discovered that a seductive woman is a trap more bitter than death. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Her passion. <laughs> Her passion is a snare, and her soft hands are chains. Come on, man. Those, <laughs> yeah, it is. those who are pleasing to God will escape her, but sinners will be caught in her snare. This, listen to his conclusion, though. This is my conclusion, says the teacher. I discovered this after looking at the matter from every possible ang angle. <laughs> Yeah. Though I have searched repeatedly, I have not found what I was looking for. Only one out of a thousand men is virtuous, but not one woman. <laughs> okay. <stop. laughs> but I find this, God created people to be virtuous. But they have each turned to follow their own downward path. So, again, this is not a rule of thumb. What is this? What is this book? This is his journal. Okay? Where is this coming from? This is coming from a man who had the pleasure of... This is coming from a man that had the pleasure of male companionship in his... In his rule, in his military, in his, under his reign. And the man, a man that had a thousand women, 700 wives, 300 concubines. And his observation yeah. is what we read about. Pleasure, vanity, worthless. It will not give you satisfaction. Now watch this principle. Here, here's the principle that applies. We will never find 100% lingering retained satisfaction in people. No matter who they are to us. See, what Solomon is doing, it sounds negative, but really he's lifting, he, he, he looks over his whole life and he has all of these experiences, and he's basically talking about how vain and fruitless these experiences were in comparison to God. Okay? We. Yeah, yeah, that's Solomon's version, and it, it's not a rule of thumb. Let me say it's not a rule of thumb, right? Yes. So my question is, when he's saying upright, what does he mean by upright? Upright is a word used to be, uh, it means just, righteous. That's what that means. Um, in verse 29, um, I believe it, he says, God made men upright, but he sought out many evil inventions. I think that's King James Version. So that's his diary on 
what God intended versus what we are, what people are in his experience. Okay. Very good question. All right. Y'all ready to move on? Any questions? Any comments? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what what is your question? With with I just want to know why we okay with the slander of the seductive woman saying that it's a trap. As far as I know about a trap, the people get trapped because they reach it in something they ain't got no business. Now this is true, but that's not what Solomon said. Oh. Solomon's in the Bible. Oh <laughs> okay. Easy answer. <laughs> now, we can get some kind of way about it, but this is the wisest man that ever lived, that ever ruled Jerusalem, writing his observations. Um, it is, again, it is not a rule of thumb. It is his observation. And the reason why some of us can't have those observations, because we'll never have that amount of experience he had. You can't have an observation if you don't have the experience that gives it to you. But with a thousand women, do you not think, do you think he can say a little something about that? <laughs> well, you know, he had a thousand, a thousand, so. No, and you know what? He, the Bible shows that his entrapment wasn't even with the ones that God winked at and that he had. It was with the ones that were heathen, based on what we read. And, I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, ratchet, okay. I guess they were ratchet. So. Uh, but ratchet can be sophisticated. Okay. <laughs> Let's move on. Okay, so again, we're looking at Solomon's diary. And I'm going to tell you the reason why I'm staying close to the text, because a book like, a book like wisdom literature can become very subjective. And I'm not, I, I won't allow it to become subjective. Okay, I'm not going to allow that because we're in Bible class. If this was not Bible class, we go wherever. But we're looking at the word of God, we're looking at a book of poetry written, and this is an inspired book, by a king, the wisest king that ever ruled Jerusalem, who Jesus would come from his descent, right? And he's writing his observation. Now watch this. He goes real low about it so that he can go real high about God. That's what this is. Real low about his experiences. He's digging in and then goes real high about God. So it principally is, the principle is trying to find what you can only find in God down here will put you in low, disappointing places. And comparatively, you'll find out that this can never compare to this. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. But they're his experiences, and we can't undo that. So let's look at principles for life. Number one, don't be faithful to what is fleeting. Don't be faithful to what is fleeting. In other words, faithfulness is a word of stay. Fleeting is a word of go. Don't be faithful to something that won't stay. I didn't say someone, but it, it covers everybody <laughs> and everything, okay? Money won't stay, okay? It, and, and I'm going to tell you how that shows up in real life. People get tipped two, three jobs, wear themselves out, being faithful to making money, but because of their wear and tear, they'll never enjoy it. You're faithful to something that's fleeting. Okay? Uh, somebody read that second one. Okay. 
under the sun, earthly. Read it again for those online. There is something deeper than what is under the sun. Okay, there, there's, more to, there's more to life than here. And I'm not talking about necessarily heaven. We know we're talking about heaven. What we're saying is something is more to life. Something deeper than here. Why? Because here is cyclic. Okay, cyclic, cyclic, I think. Whoever pronounces it, I pronounce it cyclic. Cyclic is another way to pronounce it, right? Um, I wouldn't say cyclical, I'd say cyclical, but mm -hmm. with cyclic, I say cyclic. Okay? I can rap for you too. <laughs> do a rap song. I can do a rap song about it. But uh, what do you mean? I'm saying these are just rotations. It's the same thing. Everything's the same thing. Our numeric system is cyclic. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Two, one, two, three, four, five. What is that? The numeric system is just a cycle. If you if you could do zero through ten, you got the whole numeric system. Because it's just a cycle of the same thing, different level. Okay? So don't get so this really helps us not to get so bent out of shape about trying to acquire and get wealth and get, and I'm not saying anything wrong with being wealthy, but at the end of the day, watch this, it's fleeting. The wealth can stay, but you're fleeting. I can't tell you how many funerals I've seen where the family forgets their grief about the person in the casket and their grief turns into lust about who's going to get the money. And we're doing everything we can to try to make sure everybody's right and everybody's getting the same thing. That Solomon talks about this. There is no guarantee. He talks about the unpredictability of life where a man that's righteous dies early and a man that's wicked lives forever or, you know, a long time. There is no rule of thumb. thumb. Everything is based on God's will and chance is what he says in his observation. And you know what? That's true. That's true. Okay? Uh, yes, and then we'll go on to the next one. I was just listening to this lesson and it reminded me of, uh, I think it was in maybe the late 80s or 90s, there was a commercial. There was a guy walking in a circle and the narrative that was uh, spoken while he was walking is he he worked longer hours to make more money and ultimately to buy more cocaine so he could work longer hours and stay up to make more money. To, and it was just a constant cycle. And that, this reminded me of that commercial, but way back when. Very excellent example. In that case, it's illicit pleasure. <laughs> See, whether it's illicit pleasure or legitimate pleasure, the reality is it can never satisfy. Even if he weren't, wasn't doing cocaine, what if, he, what if that thing said, I work long hours to get more money, to buy my kids more clothes, and I work more hours to get... It's not, it's not going to end. As a matter of fact, any... I'm going to tell you where, <laughs> where I first got a taste of it in reali realization. When Jayla was born, you know, you get, you know they, they get, you get their clothes and as a baby and then they grow up and they become two and three and four and you get their school clothes and, and, and you get them shoes and then two weeks later, my, my feet hurt. Dad, my foot hurt, it hurt. I just bought you those shoes. Well, what's the problem? Her foot, her foot grew, her feet grew. So now, what was relevant two weeks ago? Vanity. But thank God, 
that we had other kids and we had the hand me down. <laughs> but that was cyclic. Do you see it? It just, that's what Solomon is talking about. Okay. Pleasure, whether that was good, segue to this next one. Pleasure, whether legitimate or illicit, can never satisfy the soul. Working hard in this life does not guarantee that you will get to enjoy the result of your work. Yeah, a lot of us working hard. Watch this. We work a job all year long for two weeks of vacation. Think about it. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yo, check that out. You, you work, you do all of this, you're doing all, you're working hard, and, and, and you're doing it to build up two weeks of vacation. Yeah. And may use some of that doing some other type of work. No satisfaction here. Yes. Bishop Twyman. You know, uh, that reminds me of... Uh, Brother McLeod had just said, that was a guy that worked with me. Both of us got hired at the same time. When it comes to the point, I finally decided to retire at 62. He was a couple of years older than me. And I had talked to him, and I said, uh, are you ready to call it quits too? He said, no, I'm planning on working about 70. Then I'll retire. So I retired, and the guys kept in, in contact with me. This guy, he said, man, he need to go ahead and retire. He can barely move around on his job now, but he did work till he was 70. Soon as he's retired, he went straight to the nursing home. And 30 days later, he was dead. Never did enjoy his retirement. Didn't have no children. Do you see, this is what Solomon was talking yeah. about. And, and there, are, there are parts of his journal where he says... Enjoy while you can. If you read this, enjoy while you can. Right? I'm going to retire after this many years. Some people retire, go back to work. Right? In their 70s, going back to work. I'm just talking about some people. But there's nothing wrong with that. But what Solomon who had time and resources and, and access and, and, and money and power came to this weird conclusion that it doesn't satisfy. Okay. Here's another one, and that should be part of my typo. We are all what? Scheduled to be what? How many of you, raise your hand if you knew uh, Willie Bill Sr. Raise your hand high if you knew Willie Bill Sr. That used to be the majority. It's a very small minority. Because it doesn't matter how impactful you are in this life. Everybody is scheduled to be forgotten. Okay? Now, this is part of the vanity. Okay? They can name a street after you. They can name a school after you. Kids will say they go to that school. I go to Whitmore and won't even know who that person is. You get it? So when you live your life trying to build a legacy to be remembered, it's vanity. Because we are all scheduled to be forgotten under the sun, right? Here. This is why the thief on the cross told someone who can be with him on the other side to do what? It doesn't matter who remembers me here. Lord, you remember me. Because not only are you here, but you're there. And there is forever. Okay? That's a hard pill to swallow. They can name a scholarship after your name. Your name will be remembered, but you will be forgotten. When the generation that knew you leaves the scene, that's it. That's it. Now, unless there's a memorial, right, where Martin Luther King, we remember his accomplishments, not his life. 
We didn't know him. What was his favorite color? What, was he, what did he like to eat? <laughs> Somebody said chicken. Chicken and watermelon, huh? That's terrible. It's terrible. Jovita, Sister Jovita, that's terrible. Okay. Now, you remember I said, remember I said, this can get a little pessimistic. But Solomon is putting everything in perspective. We haven't even gotten to the text. All of this is what he's talking about. And all of this, all of his journal, all of his diary, all of this book, this wisdom literature. Only what you do for, through, and in God is lasting and satisfying. And you know how you know? Because even though we are forgotten, there are things we do that will be remembered. Now watch this. Even if they don't remember that we did them. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you it happens in Bible class sometimes. Right? People will be making comments. And five minutes can go by. And we in class like to use the term piggyback. Right? I hear that a lot in class. I want to piggyback and I want to piggyback. Everybody likes to ride the piggyback. <laughs> now people are not going to say it. But, but, but yeah, I hear that. And somebody will say, I want to piggyback over, off of some, somebody said this. In that short time, what they said was remembered. But they couldn't even remember who said it. You see it? So, so, so the principle stays. The person gets faded into the black. Because only what we do for God has lasting and lingering worth. Okay. Uh, we're almost done. So the bottom line, and I want you to look at these two photos. The bottom line is that life is inevitably fleeting and youth is temporary. I think I said that Sunday, these young people are temporary. Okay, How many of you remember when you were 18? Okay. Uh, how many of you look anything like how you look today when you were 18? Somebody here might have it. Somebody that's 19. Okay. It, the closer you are to, the eight, to from 18 is the more you look like. Them. Okay. Bobby Craig? Do you? Okay. You had a jerry curl. Now I want to see your 18-year-old pictures because I just got to see your soul glow. Uh, but, uh, okay. The... This last chapter, then there's finally this bottom line. After all that Solomon is saying, his conclusion, watch this, is, is well, second to last chapter. Uh, his conclusion is all in this chapter. It's not just the bottom, fear God and keep his commandments. It's all in this chapter. His conclusion, since we get forgotten and since all is vanity, is to remember your creator yes. while you're young. You see it? You see how it all comes together? Well, you know, okay, so this is an old Solomon writing. And he's looking back over his life. And he's saying, remember God while you're young. While you can do things that last beyond your existence. Then he talks about everything that happens through the process of maturation and aging. And what happens is there is a deficiency in capacity. That's what he's talking about. You become deficient in your capacity and in your capability and in your ability. Okay? Why? He goes through it. Our bodies, first of all, are not going to say the same. There's one verse that said, you used to get up with, when the birds chirp. That, you know, now you can sleep past the birds. <laughs> it's like some people can sleep past the alarm clock. Oh, I'm late. What happened? Right? 
Our extremities, our, our motor skills, our, our body parts were not made to sustain and to be here forever. So what happens is the lower your capacity is the less you can deposit things in this world that last. So he says, do it while you can do it. Everybody say, do it while you can do it. <laughs> Thus, the person who has the most regrets based on what Solomon says in this chapter is the person who lived their life procrastinating on everything they should have done. I need to talk to somebody who's been planning to do something for months and putting it off. When you put it off, every day you put it off, you lose some capacity. You lose some opportunity. You lose the intersection, some part of the intersection between ability and opportunity and time and opportunity and these procrastinations and which often come by way of distractions because sometimes it's a distraction-based procrastination. <coughs> Sometimes we get off track. Right? We, we can do it. We can do it. It's so easy to do it with this. Yeah, yeah in a few minutes I'm going to do it. And then you're scrolling and then you're looking and then you're looking. And a few minutes then turn to an hour. Guess what? You will never get that hour back. There are hairs on your body within that hour that are not even on your body anymore. Yeah, there are cells you've lost. I mean, everything about our makeup loses capacity. And then he goes down the list. He says, do it before the evil days come. What days? The days where you cannot and no longer have the capacity to enjoy the day. When thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Let me tell you something. Living long is only good if you're living well. Amen. There are people right now in hospitals and in nursing homes who are not enjoying life. They have it. And so when we say sometimes loosely, thank God that we woke up to see another day, if a person's in pain every day, it's hard to be thankful for another day because the quality of the day is not satisfying. It is painful. It is something they don't have pleasure. So what is it? What exactly is it that you've been procrastinating on for God? What ministry are you going to get involved in? And you've been saying it for years. You are losing Capacity. Turn to somebody and say, you're losing capacity. You're losing capacity. <laughs> somebody said, don't you tell me I'm losing capacity. You're losing capacity right now. <laughs> okay? Sounds depressing. No. Don't let it be depressing. Let it be motivating. It's designed to motivate to motivate movement while movement can happen, to motivate go while go can happen, to motivate service while service can happen, to motivate accomplishing while accomplishing can happen because there will come a day when you have no longer the capacity to serve, to accomplish, to go, to achieve. Okay? Because opportunity is limited by time and process. That's what he's saying. Okay? Let's look at it again as we close, bring this plane down for a landing. Let's look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12. He, he says, remember, before the light of the sun or the moon, verse 2, it uh, is dim to your old eyes. And rain clouds continually darken your sky. It sounds negative, but it's real. It's real. Remember him before your legs, the guards of your house, start to tremble. Okay? 
This is inevitable. I don't care. Bobby Craig, your leg's going to tremble one day. You know what? You're doing jumping jacks in a temporary body. Even Bobby Craig. At some point, Bobby Craig is going to have to tell you what to do because he can't do it himself. Now, what I used to do is I used to do the jumping jacks. You know, so that's how you, you're going to be prescribing it. Standing like this. And well, I don't tell you to do. Okay. <laughs> it's inevitable. There was a guy at Marcellus Avenue at the men's thing, uh, and he was, uh, I think some of us men went, and uh, he was a fitness guy, and he was struggling to do push-ups, but he was doing it in spite of things that have happened to him in life. He was still a fitness guy, but those looking on, you wouldn't have been able to tell he was a fitness guy because he was a little feeble. You can, you retain, you can retain knowledge, but ability, capacity is gone. Fleeting. Fleeting. It's fleeting as we speak on all of us, right? So uh, time and process. So he talks about he talks about that. Remember him before your legs tremble. Remember him before your teeth. Your few remaining servants stop grinding. Choppers. Okay. And you say, well, uh, such and such is so 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 many years old and got all their teeth. How do you know? <laughs> okay, that's all I'm going to say on that. Okay. So all of these things before the door of life's opportunity, verse 4, is closed and the sound of work is that opportunity. That's, we, we're losing capacity and every day this is what's happening to opportunity. So whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. Stop procrastinating. If you're going to get the degree, go get it. If you are going to accomplish that, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, stop putting it off. You don't have the capacity. Now, that's just in life. If you're going to do ministry, if you're going to reach out to people for Jesus, if you're going to, if you're going to be an instrument for God's glory, do it while you can do it. Okay? Uh, let's read this. Respecting and obeying God is the duty of man. The whole duty of man is to fear God, keep his commandments, right? Because it all ends with God's judgment. For God will bring everything into judgment. Uh, every secret thing, whether it's good or evil. The whole essence of our lives, okay? We all have as many public things as secret things as, as we have public things. Every one of us. Because you know what secret things include? Things we've thought. We do know, and you do know, that God is not just judging what matures into behavior. He's judging the thoughts that are in our mind. That's a secret thing. Okay? Now, again, this is not to scare us. Thank God for grace. Thank God for Jesus. Yes. That right there, that point right there, that right there, yeah. is evidence that we all need grace. There's nobody beyond it. Because if he's judging this without grace, none one of us will make it. Okay? That's the whole duty of man. To do what you can do while you can before capacity fades and to respect God and uh, keep his commandments. Um, I'm going to ask, can you do the... Yes. And the lesson is yours. All right. I got a mic. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Brother Hamilton, for that lesson. And I think the thing about that lesson to me is... When you hear a lesson like that, it seems like, wow, how am I going to do an invitation off of a sobering lesson like that? But the reality is, it's precisely because of a lesson like that, why we need to invite you to Christ. Yes. Because without Christ, you're going to get a lesson like that. And like Brother Hamilton said earlier on, 
you're going to be depressed. You're going to start looking at these scripture carnally. And by, by that, what I mean is you're going to start saying, well, wait a minute. Are you saying I'm not supposed to try to be successful in this life? Are you saying I'm not supposed to work hard? Are you saying I'm not supposed to try to get, you know, a nice home and take care of my family? No, not saying that at all. But if you're not in Christ, you're going to miss, you're going to miss the point. You're going to miss the larger point. And the larger point is it's okay to pursue those things but you just don't want to prioritize those things because ultimately God did not create you for those things. That's not what you, why you were created. And so why the invitation is important is because the invitation, if you accept the invitation, because we heard the word, and if you're willing to repent, confess, and be baptized, then what you have an opportunity to do is once you've received that Holy Spirit, once you've received that gift, once you start to live your life for Christ, you start to read and interpret what we just heard, not in a negative light, but in a joyous light. When you realize that this, I'm, I'm, I'm better than this. I'm made for more than this. You're going to be able to deal with those. Uh, instead of pursuing all of those riches and getting depressed because you don't make it, because you're struggling, you're going to be saying, yeah, but this is all temporary anyway. Yeah. Something, something better for me. And you will never understand that. You'll never have, a, have the opportunity to be recognized as one of his and to be remembered for doing what he tells you to do, if you don't have that gift, if you don't have that spirit, if you try to say, I'm going to do it on my own, guess who's won? Not only is that vanity pointless, that's vanity in that you think you're better than God. That's vanity to however you want to you know, play it. But at the end of the day, you got no shot. You have no shot. You're going to be on that couch. You're going to be stressed out. You're going to be aging. You're going to be losing. You're going to be doing all of these things if you don't realize step one is getting Christ. You need to get in Christ. If you're in Christ, then you don't pursue all of those vanities. You pursue Christ. You prioritize Christ. Again, not saying it ain't good to have a nice car. But maybe you just need a car. When you want the BMW, and I, I plead guilty. When I wanted the BMW, it's because I grew up saying, the BMW is going to give me status. Now, I'm much more mature, man. I just need a car to get me from A to B. Get me from A to B. So that I can focus my resources on the kingdom. Focus more of my resources if all of my resources are focused on pursuing those material things, you only have so much time and you only have so much resources. You only have so much blessings. You focus them too much on these material, carnal, worldly things, you got less available to focus on the kingdom. And that's what we hear about. But you will never get there. You'll never appreciate that. You're not one of his. So this invitation is an opportunity, a chance for you. Don't procrastinate on this, because what do we always say about tomorrow? It ain't promised. It's not promised. So if you're watching online, if you're here, and you want an opportunity to be reprioritized, to be transformed, to be changed, this invitation is for you. Because you're going to receive, if you're baptized, you receive that gift of that Holy Spirit. You have now started on that journey, that new life, to where you're going to be looking at this book. And you ain't going to be all depressed about it. You're not going to misinterpret it. You're going to have a better opportunity to understand it. So do you want that? Do you want to have that opportunity? If you do... As we stand, this invitation is extended to you and 
as we sing the song of invitation. was good. Now I can take off my invitation and move into who I am. So we're here to do announcements. What announcements do we have? I know we ha we're class tomorrow, so we got us uh, Senior Saint Super Thursday tomorrow. What is it? Next Thursday. What's tomorrow? Just regular Bible. Regular Bible uh, tomorrow. What ten o'clock? I should know that by now. Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. Do we have any other announcements? Any other announcements? Again, we want to congratulate the leeches. <laughs> beautiful thing, beautiful thing. Had a good time, had a good time. It's funny, just as, as we were getting ready to leave, man, the DJ put on Sparrow. Now, y'all won't know who Sparrow is, but if you come from the Caribbean, Sparrow is big time. It's like a big time artist. I'm like, man, and we were getting ready to leave. I'm like, baby, maybe I need to go back up in there and, you know, do some, do some Calypso Soko, but, but we left. But beautiful, it was, I'm just so, so happy, happy for y'all. All right, so a prayer request then. I don't think we had any other announcements, so we just want to go into the prayer request. In fact, maybe in the interest of time, what we might want to do is get into a circle and kind of share your pr prayer requests within that circle. And then, and then I think that was, so, so we'll have one group here. We'll have a group of folks and I'll join this group. And then we'll have a group there. So just huddle up, hold hands, let your prayer requests be known within that circle. And then we'll be uh, dismissed. It's just in the interest of time. Let the people online know. Okay, and the, for those who are online, yeah, we're not going to be going around and, and having individual announcements. So if you're online uh, in your homes or whatever, you can do the same thing. Just grab a hold of the person that's with you, share your prayer requests, and do your prayer. And then after after the individual after the prayers have been completed within the circle, then we're dismissed. <laughs> 